Hello, good afternoon. I'm Fiona Maddox. I'm much happier sitting where you are. And um, I think Julia is too. Yes. Um, <laughs> I'd like to introduce Julia Boyd, who's written this marvellous book, Village in the Third Reich, which some of you, many of you may already have read, and the rest of you will be obliged to read <laughs> after really. Julia has finished talking. Um, we're going to, as I quite palpably am not an expert on this area, um, uh, but I do know Julia, and Julia has asked me not to give a long introduction. She said, just let's just talk in a rather <laughs> aggressive way, if I may <laughs> say, Julia. Um, but Julia worked for a while at the V&A, and although in 2023, I think no woman wants to be identified by her husband, um, I would say in this case, I'm going to mention her late husband, John Boyd, without whom I wouldn't know Julia. So I think That's occasionally true. people have a value, yes. we can mention Quite them, um, uh, who was ambassador apart from anywhere else to Japan, which is when Julia started her very impressive writing career, writing a book about leprosy, um, which, as she says, is not the jolliest subject, but she has gone on to some other not, not jolly, jolly subjects, subjects yes. which she manages yeah. to present in a very humane and incredibly readable and lively and personal way in the way that she tells the story of people's lives. Um, I'm just going to, having disobeyed Julia, I'll now <laughs> obey her and just say, Julia, what is this book about? Well, thank you all so much for coming today. Um, well, the book tells the story of one German village, Oberstdorf, um, which is, as it happens, the most southern village in Germany. It's right down at the bottom of the country, uh, on the Austrian border in Bavaria, and uh, about 100 miles from the nearest city, Munich. And the book covers the period from the end of the First World War until 1955, when Germany was given back its sovereign rights. And the reason it's been possible to tell this story is really because of the enormous quantity of material there is out there in the shape of unpublished memoirs, diaries, letters, recorded interviews, and of course, a, a lot of archival material. And in fact, the most important source for this book is really Oberstdorf's own archives, which has been very carefully maintained since the uh, Second World War. And I think that is a great credit to the village because, as you can imagine, when the war was finally over, uh, Germany lay in ruins, people were starving, and all they wanted to do was to forget everything about the Nazis. And the temptation to destroy documents and evidence must have been enormous. So I think it's very commendable that the uh, Oberstdorf archives is in such good shape. Well, having gathered all these odd bits of jigsaw together, um, it was possible to create, I think, a surprisingly detailed uh, history of Oberstdorf during these years, and to even follow some of the villagers right through to, to the end. Um, I think the, the, the question of how a country, it was possible for a country like Germany to um, fall so catastrophically for Hitler, and to be in the grip of this regime for 12 long years, I think it's a question that never entirely goes away. So by looking really closely, deeply, into this small community, the hope was that um, even if there are no definitive answers, maybe a few new clues would occur, and perhaps some fresh insights to help us understand why Germans made the decisions they did, um, and how their, their views and attitudes changed as the years went by. I suppose, in other words, to try and give a sense of what it was really like to be a German in these years. Um, and, you know, I was born, as is very obvious, just after the war, and um, grew up very much in the atmosphere that uh, everybody in Germany was either a, a monster or a hero. They seemed to be nothing in between. And one thing I hope does emerge from this book is perhaps a more 
nuanced version of these events. Well, Julia, before we get into any more detail of the very, the, the wide range of the, the capacious nature of this book, take us back. You have written, uh, I happen to have here, when I <laughs> prepared <my> earlier, <laughs> this um, extremely good book, which you, I think we can say is a companion. <laughs> I'm going to go into advertising <laughs> after this. Um, <laughs> Travelers in the Third Reich. Was, was this how you started? I mean, how did you get hooked well, I, into, I have to confess, into this town, into this village? I have to confess immediately that neither the village book nor its predecessor, Travelers, was my idea. In fact, um, when it was first suggested to me that I write a book about um, foreigners traveling in Nazi Germany, I hooted with laughter because, you know, it's a subject about which so much has been written and by brilliant historians. So the idea that I would have anything to add to the mix seemed to me ludicrous, but I was intrigued enough to go and do some digging. And you had lived in Germany? Um, yes, but a long time ago. I had lived in Germany, but it, that was really important because um, it gave me a sense of the country and a feel for the people. So that really made a difference. But it was really the archival stuff, going back to the unpublished material, that's what hooked me. It's what I call raw, unfiltered history. And there's just so much of it out there. Um, and so that turned into Travelers in the Third Reich. But after that, I thought that was it. I completely done with the Nazis. And then I met this lovely woman, Angelica Patel, who I call Kati, um, who asked me if I'd write a book about her village. Her family has lived in Oberstdorf for five generations or more. Again, I wasn't a bit keen because um, I thought it'd be impossible for a random Brit like me to get close enough to the village to write anything interesting or sensible about it. And and apart from anything else, I mean, Oberstdorf, as I've just said, is miles away from anywhere. So it seemed very unlikely that it could possibly have anything useful to say about these great momentous uh, events. Well, I was completely wrong about that because I soon discovered that um, there really was hardly any aspect of the war or the Third Reich that didn't affect the villagers one way or, or another. Tell us, just tell us first about your, um, the point at which you thought, okay, I'll do this. Which yes. Is, um, that's did, was it when you went there? Did no, it was, it was really the going... fact that Catty had already written a book. Um, the village, interestingly enough, had got a committee together in the early part of this century because they felt they must record their Nazi history before all those people who'd actually lived through it ha had died. And so they commissioned my friend Catty to write a, a book, and so that was for me a wonderful launch pad. Wasn't one book enough? Well, it was, no, she wanted me to write a completely different kind of book, one that would appeal to people who perhaps didn't know much about Germany or never heard of Oberstdorf. So they're very different, the books, but her book had um, essential information for me, but also she conducted lots of interviews with the villagers when they still had vivid memories of the, the Nazi period. And so by the time I came onto the scene, of course, most of them had, had sadly died. So that's really the background to and, how it started. And still in the present, or the present in terms of your writing the book, how many people did you meet who were well, um, still alive or were there none? Very few. I met one um, uh, um, marvellous lady, Trudel Heckmeyer, who was the widow of the man who led the first successful... Um, ascent of the north face of the Eiger. Um, but really, it's a long time ago now, and they, there are a couple who are still just alive. But um, It particularly it interested me. Um, you said, oh, no, no, that's nothing to do with it, when I said, what about the ascent of the north face of the Eiger? It seems to have been a period when mm. doing something f foolish and impossible, like climbing a mountain, was... It was, it was very much of the time, wasn't yes, it? Yes, and of course, this had huge propaganda um, for, the, for the Nazis because um, the, the uh, expedition consisted of four climbers, uh, two Germans and two Austrians. And they climbed it in July, I think it was, 1938, just three months after the Anschluss. 
And of course, um, this was the perfect propaganda because many people thought that the north face of the Eiger was impossible to climb. And here were two Germans and two Austrians conquering the unconquerable. So um, there was a lot of pressure on uh, Andel Heckmeyer, the leader, who was the guy who lives in Oberstdorf, to become a sort of very prominent Nazi, which he managed to resist. So let's go back to presumably the mid-1930s, or is it later than that, that the whole shadow of the rise of the Nazis began to impact on this village? Well, it actually was much sooner than that. Um, Hitler became uh, chancellor in January 1933, and two months later held a, an election. And this election really was a, a turning point because um, it was very clear after this election that the Nazis intended to their tentacles to go into every last bit of German life, of everybody's life. And so um, a Nazi mayor was actually imposed on the village. And this was a terrible shock to the villagers because they, though they had voted for Hitler, they'd been used to running their own affairs for generations. And suddenly this Nazi mayor, who was an outsider and was telling them what to do about every small last thing, they hated it. They managed to get rid of him. Uh, and, but I think it was a shock to them to realize that though they had voted for, they wanted strong government, um, they felt that the Weimar gov government was impossible, hopeless. So they wanted strong government, but they'd wanted it on their terms, and they didn't want outsiders running the village for them. But uh, that's how it was. And, um, you know, any uh, chance of protesting um, or thinking perhaps you weren't so keen on the Nazis after all was really impossible because if you complained or resigned your post or you said anything, you were sort of slapped into protective custody somewhere like Dachau. So that election was very crucial and it was like a sort of iron curtain coming down and um, life for anybody who uh, was a dissenter after that, unless you were prepared to accept your fate, was impossible. It seems, I, I felt when I was reading it, and the way you very vividly describe the arrival of the Nazis, that initially some people were thought, as you say, this is quite a good thing, but the actual oppression that quite quickly became evident, where if you didn't become a, a Nazi, you were going mm -hmm. to suffer. Uh, what was the length of time, would you say, between the, the, the Nazi mayor and the fact that you might get deported um, or, or worse? Well, that really happened pretty much immediately. Um, the, uh, Before 1939? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, 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 funnily enough, Oberstdorf, this is, this is, I find this quite interesting, they weren't particularly interested in the Nazis until uh, really just before this 1933 election. Uh, the burning of the Reichstag had a big impact because if um, Oberstdorfers didn't particularly like the Nazis initially, they liked the communists even less. And uh, the burning of the Reichstag was blamed on the Nazis, on the uh, communists. So um, the village, I think that was the turning point for the village. That's when they decided that they were going to vote for Hitler. But there was always this discrepancy between Hitler, who everybody thought was completely and utterly wonderful, but they didn't necessarily like all the trappings around him. They didn't like the noisy stormtroopers marching through the village because it was bad for tourism. And interestingly... Um, <laughs> you would think it might put them off. The, the, yeah. the, the Jewish question... Um, uh, Oberstdorf had been a very poor rural community, but tourism had begun in the late 19th century, and had made a huge economic difference to the village. And so that was more important than anything. So they welcomed Jews to the village because they brought money. And so when the Julius Streicher's horrible uh, anti-Semitic publication attacked Oberstdorf for welcoming Jewish tourists, the Oberstdorf, um, the mayor and the town hall, made a very robust response. Um, so it was never very anti-Semitic, but whether that was because 
um, they felt strongly that the Jews shouldn't be persecuted in this way, or whether it was because they wanted um, the, the, the Jewish people to come as tourists, it's, it's hard to tell. Um, but it's certainly clear that some people just felt they would, in whatever way they could, turn a blind eye yes. and, and oh, I think support that's... the Nazis and, and harbour. Well, I think every village and small town had its own unique response to the Nazis, but I think one thing they had in common, as far as I understand it, is that even a small community like Oberstdorf, there was an extraordinary range of, of, of diversity in their reaction to the Nazis. So you would have people who absolutely dedicated Nazis, remain so to the bitter end and beyond. Then there were people who set out as very keen Nazis, but then as the regime showed its true colors, rather changed their minds. And then there were people who were against it from the start. And there were others who just wanted to keep their heads down and somehow survive it all. So there was, even in a, a quite a small community, and Oberstdorf's um, population was about 4,000 before the war, 8,000 at the end because of refugees and evacuees and so on. Um, so even, as I say, within a small community, there was a, a, a big range of, of um, response to the Nazis. And there, was, uh, a, there were a couple of people in particular that you talk about, the opera singer. Yes. That's yes. Um, um, what is interesting, though, is, I mean, the mayor, the second mayor of Oberstdorf, who was a chimney sweep by profession, was a very different cup of tea from the first one. And though he was uh, very... Uh, enthusiastic Nazi and made Nazi speeches in the market square, um, he clearly lost faith in National Socialism when he saw what was happening. And he protected um, the few Jews that were living in Oberstdorf, including Hetta Stolzenberg, who um, was a very well-known opera singer. You can still hear her on YouTube. And I think she performed... Um, uh, the leading role for in the first um, production of Fuccini's Fanciulla del West. Anyway, she went to Oberstdorf, and partly because Mayor Fink was such a benign uh, Nazi, um, she lived there with her mother throughout the whole war, unmolested, and she trained a choir in the Protestant church, and was a... I think people knew she was Jewish, but it was never really... And she about. survived. And she survived, yes. The duration. Yes. Yes. Um, that, um, that's that's a, a particularly, I mean, a very lov a lovely thing for a reader we, uh, going through this book is that people, you can't get to know all the people because there are about, I don't know, hundreds of, of them that you name. Afraid, yes. But right. there are certain yeah. that you, you cling on to and you see their, but their to story told right till the end the bitter end in some cases. There were cases. two um, Jewish inhabitants there in Oberstdorf who, um, they were so-called privileged Jews. That meant they were either married to somebody who was non-Jewish or they only had one Jewish grandparent. And they had survived, thanks to, again, to this nice Nazi mayor, um, they had survived right to the 1945. But then the, the Gestapo, for some reason, decided to um, send all these privileged Jews to uh, Theresienstadt. And rather than do that, they committed suicide. So there, and another Jewish um, inhabitant, a dentist, managed to escape to America just before Kristallnacht with his family, um, thanks to a Dutch aristocrat who was living in the village and managed to get the money together and they, they were saved. The uh, accounts of the summer camps and so on I mean, there's, a, there's a, a, a powerful nostalgia about some aspects of that for the young who yes. must have loved to go off and work yes. in the fields or whatever, or, or do their... Um, harvesting and so on, yes. Harvesting, and I mean, what, what, what would it have been like for, to be young in Well, I, th I, I think that's a very interesting question because, I mean, it was, it was a, although tourism certainly helped the economy, it was still a very tough life in Oberstdorf. You know, rural farming was at the heart of the village, and children were expected at a very young age to go out and look after the cows and the high pastures and so on. So the Nazis absolutely understood that if their um, empire was going to last for a thousand years, as they boasted, they had to capture the youth. And so 
children joined the uh, junior branches of the Hitler Youth and the Bund Deutsche Mädel, which was the girls' version, at the age of 10. And then at 14, they graduated to the, the senior bit. And then at 18, they went straight into the Wehrmacht, or the girls went into the Reich Labour Service. So from the age of 10, they were brainwashed and um, being, were being told that the Führer was their saviour. But in the early 30s, I mean, the early part of from the, before it got serious and closer to the war, a lot of it was very like the Boy Scouts and the Girl Guides. Um, they went on, as you say, Fiona, they went on camping trips. They sat round bonfires singing songs like um, follow the Nazi flag and feeble bones must tremble and things like this. Um, and in a way, the, the Nazis very successfully stole the children from their families and their parents. Um, but then, by the late 30s, it had become um, much more serious. The boys were basically doing military training, and the girls were working um, in factories and, and on you farms mean, uh, and so on. clearly away from the village by this time? Because well, there no, were, probably um, well, weren't, were the factories? In well, yes, that's true. I mean, what, what they did, which is it must have been very tough. These young women um, were sent, purposely sent, hundreds of miles away to very distant destinations, which must have been very tough on them because most of them had never been very far from the village at all. And they had a really a hideous time. I mean, I quote in the book some of the experiences of these young people, and it was pretty grim. Um, I, I'd love you to talk us through some of the more dominant figures apart from the Nazi mayor, just people that yeah. remained with you or touched you in particular ways because you get inside people's lives in a very yes. detailed way. And sometimes I thought, how do you, where did you get this information <laughs> from? I'm sure you didn't make it up. But no, um, <laughs> I mean, that's one thing. You know, it, it, the trouble about this kind of writing is that inevitably there are sort of gaps. I, exactly. And, and if yes. you're writing fiction, you can fill the gaps, you know, if you're Hilary Mantel, you do it really well. But um, I absolutely stuck to facts and, um, if possible, always tried to reinforce them. It's a bit like a, taking an x-ray of a bone. You take it from different angles so you get the true picture. And in a way, that's what I've always tried to do, is to get corroboration from several sources. Um, but yes, I, People in the village that who I, 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 I felt affection for. Well, I think one of the... Um, I've got some pictures to show you at the end, so some of the people I'm talking about we can, we can look at. Um, if you go through the spectrum, at the Nazi end, one of the most interesting people was a guy called Otto Hermann Hoyer, who was Hitler's favourite artist. He'd had his arm amputated, his right arm amputated after the First World War. And, but he taught himself to paint with his left arm. And he painted one of the most um, uh, familiar images of the whole period, which was called In the Beginning Was the Word, which where, Christ, uh, where Hitler is depicted as the Messiah. Oh, and he's his, preaching. his arm up? Is it the one with him uh, with his arm? We'll, we'll see. Oh, okay. oh, oh, well, anyway, um, I have got the... There's the... There's your... Yes, I didn't realize that it was... We might as well look at this now. Um, this is the village. Um, and this is my lovely collaborator, Kati Patel. And this was Trudel Heckmeyer's house. It was like stepping back into the 30s. It was, you know... Just how so I imagine many Oberstdorf homes were in the 1920s. So whose house? Tell uh, us again. The, the widow of the guy who climbed the north face of the Eiger. So we see the... Oh, sorry, sorry. Can, back. The, can, can you go back? Yeah. Upright piano, yes. um, some sort of very traditional cafe. Yes, or, and the, the light and the panelling. And there were pictures on the wall. Uh, Andal Heckmeyer had a very good friend who was also a Nazi artist. Um, and who Hitler also bought one of his paintings. One of his pictures is hanging in this house. But um, and then uh, this is Rief, um, Lenny Riefenstahl, who was um, Hitler's great propaganda chief, who used to go climbing with Andal Heckmeyer. But was was she ever in? Yes, she was in Oberstdorf, Oberstdorf. and, and he. But um, 
doesn't doesn't crop up in the archives or does? No, um, but um, Trudel Heckmeyer brought out a wonderful photograph album which was packed with all sorts of amazing photographs, including that one. This is Hermann Hoyer, and he's painting, he's actually painting um, this picture, which is oh, called yes. In the Beginning Was the Word, and it's deliberately showing Hitler like a messiah. And really, the more I read about it, the more I realized that uh, the whole Nazi thing is like a sort of cult religion. Um, it, it, it just seemed to me mesmerize people, and, and Hitler was this sort of godlike figure for them. Anyway, um, I don't know what's next, but that... Uh, it, so Horia was one of the people that I, um, um, you know, found very interesting as an example of somebody who was an absolutely committed Nazi and s stayed so. Um, but then there were people like Mia Fink, who we've already talked about, who changed their minds. And then there's this lovely family, if I can... Uh, the, yes, there is Fink, with a, even with a sort of Hitler moustache, giving a, um, a robust Nazi speech the, in the marketplace. This is the village square? This is the village square, yes. Um, and then... Um, and there's Mayor Fink, again, um, uh, in a, not looking like a Nazi at all. In fact, one of his sons was uh, epileptic, and his wife was very devout Catholic. So um, I think the interesting thing is we all think of, you know, we know there are good Germans, but it takes quite a, a, a lot of thinking to believe in good Nazis. But I think was somebody who was clearly very ambivalent, um, and that's what makes him, I think, so interesting. Um, Yes, this was the slide I wanted to show you. Now, you were asking oh. me one of my favorite people. Well, yes, one of them that was, was the Franz Neuchel, story. who is yeah. the boy sitting there. And he wrote a memoir, and the family very kindly gave me access to it. And he was um, 10, I think, when the war started. Um, and his memories were absolutely invaluable source for the book. The whole family were absolutely anti um, Hitler. A lot of the true men of the mountains in the village didn't like the Nazis at all. And um, his father was uh, absolutely uh, against, against Hitler. And his wife was always in a state of, her nerves were always um, absolutely shattered because her husband, Xavier, was very outspoken. And she was terrified that um, he would say something and they'd all be arrested and uh, sent off to Dachau. I mean, an example like that is a very interesting one. What did he leave that showed his distaste for the Nazis? How did he dare to say anything or anything that was recorded that you, all these years later, well, it, can it, find? It, um, or it was is because it of his son's memoir. Um, Franz Neupel yes. is the boy sitting down there. Zeva and his wife um, are standing at, at the... Um, at the back, and, and it was this wonderful memoir, which was a private memoir. It so it was only through the memoir, really? Yes, Otherwise, you wouldn't have known. Well, then, no, there were some other references, I mean, well, too. How much were, did people speak out? Do um, we know? Very little, really very I mean, little. Surely, very I mean, little. I'll give you an example. Yeah. Um, uh, they, all the villagers listened to the radio. Of course, that was strictly uh, against the law, but they did it. And the Neuchel family um, used to listen a lot. And one day, there was a a rap on the door, and Frau Neuchel fled, thinking that they were all going to be arrested. But actually, it was their next-door neighbour coming to borrow a sh snow shovel and thought it would be a hugely funny joke to pretend he was a, a Gestapo official. Um, <laughs> and, but then a few days later, and this is... you know, Very few people were actually arrested, surprisingly enough, but there was a terrific climate of fear. You never knew. You didn't dare tell a joke. In the, especially in the post office, which was a hotbed of Nazis, in case somebody overheard you. And occasionally people were sent off to prison. Um, it, it really happened. But a few days later, um, in the marketplace, that rather delicious blonde boy, um, one of the signature tunes for the French radio station was Patata, Patata. And this little blonde boy 
um, suddenly in the market square, with loads of people all around them, started jumping up and down and shouting at the top of his head, Padata, Padata. So Frau Neukel went absolutely sheet white, according to her older son, because if anybody had heard them, you know, they would have known exactly that they'd been listening to this forbidden um, uh, radio station. So it, it, there was this, you know, everybody was always anxious um, that they might be dobbed in. And, and what I, I would very much like to know is whether you had a sense, you, you, you dug very deep into this village and its archive, but was it typical? Was every little village going through the same, or was it particularly susceptible for any reason, its tourism or its... Um, I mean, was it atypical? Was it? I can't really answer that because I don't know enough about all the other villages. But um, I, th because I think, as I said earlier, they all had their own unique relationship with the regime. But um, I think there are overlapping things. I think what I've just been talking about now, that you had to be very careful what yeah. you said, was something Typical. that would have been true uh, of all villages. For instance, when the bomb plot failed uh, to assassinate Hitler in July 44, um, it was announced on the wireless, and there are good reports of people sitting in the pub, absolutely frozen, not daring to react, because, you know, um, they didn't... If, if you had sort of said anything, you might have been arrested. So, uh, but the, the Gestapo was actually a relatively small outfit, so, um, it, but it had a... a it, it produced a sense of fear that was um, disproportionate to its actual size. So I can't really say with any real knowledge whether no, Oberstdorf was <laughs> typical, but uh, I think there's always going to be overlap, but each community was itself, really. And after 1939, when war had actually broken out rather than this dark lead-up to it, um, what happened in the village at that point? Do you, can you recount well, the impact of...? Yeah, I mean, at first, I think even the people who hadn't actively supported Hitler were really pleased. I mean, the Blitzkrieg was the most astonishing achievement, um, these fantastic victories. And, you know, everybody, regardless of whether they were pro or anti-Nazi, had felt so deeply the humiliation of the Treaty of Versailles and uh, Germany's defeat in the First World War. Um, and so everybody, it was one of the reasons why, well, it was one of the main reasons why Hitler was came to power was people longed to see Germany put back at the top table of nations to have its prestige and prosperity restored. So at the beginning of the war, it all seemed that actually Hitler was going to deliver on his promise of a fast and uh, quick victory. But then when um, they invaded the Soviet Union, everybody was terrified, uh, and then, of course, things went from bad to worse. So by the end of the war, people had totally lost faith with it, and it was just a matter of trying to stay alive and survive it all. Um, and the, you know, things got progressively worse for the village, and one has to remember there were enormous numbers of people coming in, first um, evacuees from the bombing in northern Germany, and then there were refugees fleeing the Russians when they advanced. So the village had to cope with all these people. They had to feed them. There were pregnant women because Oberstdorf was thought to be a safe place to have a, have a baby. Um, it, it became harder and harder. There was less and less food. Well, how um, did they feed them? I mean, well, it sounds as though it was a, a farming huge in, influx. I mean, hundreds or Oh, more? thousands, about 4,000. So um, double the size. Double the size. Yeah. Well, it was a rural community. Um, so there were farms, there were pigs, there was cattle, um, and uh, people ate very little, and the rations were pretty dis disgusting. Um, but they did survive. It was even worse, funnily enough, after the war. That's, that was the hardest time of all for villagers. They were all, many Germans became very close to starvation. Um, but the, um, d during the war, um, do we know roughly what number of villagers, young men, would have gone off? Yes, and there are about. Being um, killed? It's, 
I've, I've reckoned there were probably about five or six hundred young men fighting, of which a couple of hundred were killed. And uh, we were very lucky. Um, I was given access to two diaries kept by soldiers who fought with the 99th Regiment of the 1st Mountain Division, which is where most of the Oberstdorfer boys fought. So um, thanks to these two diaries, I mean, they were written by soldiers who live quite close by, but they fought alongside the Oberstdorf boys. And so I was able to track them right the way through the war. And in some circumstances, I knew how they died. Um, uh, it, 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 you know, they're, they're very powerful, these diaries. Um, and it, it was an extraordinary experience to sort of really live it from a German soldier's point of view. But there was as, as another Oberstdorfer who was a member of the Einsatzgruppe, which was this horrifying unit whose job it was to go into the newly conquered territories after the Wehrmacht and murder gypsies, Jews, homosexuals, anybody they didn't like. And one Oberstdorfer, a guy called uh, Heinz Schubert, who claimed to be descended from one of Schubert's brothers, was um, responsible for organizing the murder of uh, 700 um, gypsies in Crimea. And after the war, he was tried um, in, uh, the Nurem at the Nuremberg trials. And he, he you know, the, the other people being tried with him, there was a priest, there was a philosopher, there were lawyers. These were not psychopaths. And when he was um, speaking in his trial, he said, we thought we were saving Western civilization. And I think these young men had been so brainwashed from the age of 10 uh, and then into the, into the army to believe that they, were, that they were the master race. And as they invaded Poland and they saw these terribly poor villages, you know, they must have felt, yes, you know, it's very different back in Bavaria with their neat villages and so on. So um, this man, Heinz Schubert, was from Oberstdorf, and you wonder what he, you know, when he came back on leave, when all these soldiers came back on leave, what did they tell their families? Um, which is one of the reasons when, you know, people often say, well, how much did Germans know? Mm -hmm. I think even in a village as remote as Oberstdorf, they knew a great deal because the soldiers were always coming back. And when did they leave. know about place, the, the camps? Well, there were camps all around Oberstdorf. Well, it um, does seem, I, I couldn't quite get the geography of how close they were, because... They're very, they were very close. There was a waffen -SS training camp just a few miles to the south, and then there were um, slave labor camps, people taken from Poland and um, uh, Eastern Europe and France and Holland, too, and made to work in these uh, camps making engines for Messerschmitt and BMW when they evacuated their manufacturers out of Munich when the Allies could bomb there. And so they saw these people in striped uniforms marching all around Oberstdorf. And one of the things that was complete news to me, the big camps that we've all heard of, Auschwitz and Dachau and so on, they spawned dozens and dozens of, of sub-camps and there was something like three or yes, four sub-camps sub -camps from Dachau around Oberstdorf. So yes, they had these camps all around them. Yes, their soldiers were coming back on leave. They may well have taken part in atrocities themselves, and they would certainly have witnessed them. And then um, there were all the evacuees coming, and then there were the refugees, and people were involved in the mechanics of the atrocities, you know, running the gas um, chambers and so on. Um, so my feeling is, although people may have just not tried to think about it, I, I think it's very hard not to believe that even in a village like Oberstdorf, uh, so far from the center of things, that people didn't know an awful lot. The people who remained very convinced Nazis would say, oh, it's enemy propaganda. The others knew, but what could they do, really? I, they, you know, they must also have seen once the policy to include anyone with any difference or disability, um, once they suddenly started disappearing, like the poor little oh, blind well, yes. child. One That's of the worst a chapters. Heartbreaking. Um, I don't know how you. Some of this. Was I don't really know how hard. you wrote it. It must have been it was very, really, very, really hard. Um, there was a, um, a. I've got his picture here somewhere. Um, 
um, there was a, a, a blind boy. He was the son of a... Um, um, there he is. Um, he was born blind. He was the son of a former mayor of Oberstdorf. And uh, he was, just shortly after his 19th birthday, he was gassed um, because as a blind child, well, blind teenager by then, he Who was, was doing very well. Yes, he was doing very accounts. well. He had a beautiful voice. He was very, very musical. He used to sing as a very small child in the church. But he then went off to various institutions and he was taught all sorts of skills. So the hope was that he would come back and live in Oberstdorf with his family. But um, he, was, um, he was gassed when he, just after his 19th birthday. This is something Hitler had been wanting to do for a very long time. First, it was forced sterilization. Then it was killing children who were disabled or had something wrong, sometimes just because they were unruly. And then it was killing adults in institutions and hospitals, but that was too slow. So then they started gassing them in specially built um, centers around Germany. These were Germans. Um, and, you know, it's really hard to get your head around this. And I, I think if there's any justification for writing this kind of what some people call micro-history. You know, I've read a lot about the Holocaust, obviously. I had seen all the images that we've all seen. I knew the horrors of what happened. But when I read about it through the focus, through the lens of this boy in the village, somehow it has an effect that is so much more compelling and deeper. And I thought a lot about the Jewish refugees in London, there was something like 25,000 Jewish refugees in uh, northwest London, and I thought about this place here, um, how it must have been such a solace to them. You know, they'd, it was such an effort to get out of Germany, and then they'd had to leave their families behind. They didn't know whether they'd ever see them again. Perhaps not all of them could speak English. Um, and to be able to come to Wigmore Hall, as so many of them did, and to hear the music with which they'd grown up and performed by other Jewish refugees, performing Jewish composers, I think Wigmore Hall played a, a really huge part in, in helping them cope with what they had to deal with. Um, and it wasn't just Theodor Weissenberger who um, you know, touched me. It was, there were other stories. Um, one of the privileged Jews who went to Theresienstadt, the end of the war, she witnessed the um, arrival to Theresienstadt from Auschwitz of one of the death marches. And her description of that etched in my mind forever. You know, I, I, I still, and listening here at Wigmore to late Beethoven or whatever it is, it, it's overwhelming. Um, I think it's really hard to get your head round. Well, I would say that for anyone who hasn't read the book, that the power of that feeling and Julia's perception make it a very, very intense and, and moving read. But let's look at some more of your oh, pictures. Right. Yes. We... Um, so that's, um, let me go back to the previous one, I think. Um, yes, oh, this I've just mentioned, um, this is a jolly group of SA guys in Oversorf having a very merry time. And the reason why it's interesting is third from the right, smiling with a moustache, is the headmaster of the secondary school in Oberstdorf. And he's an interesting character because he's one of these people um, who is neither a hero nor a monster, but like I suspect thousands, if not millions of Germans, tried to navigate a, a middle course. Um, the Nazis imposed a horrendous curriculum on the school. And he tried to keep a sense of humanity. He tried to, um, it was difficult because any false step on his part and the children or other teachers would have, would have um, informed on him. But he did do his best to keep, as I say, a sense of what it is to be human in his school, despite the pressures from the Nazis. Um, but he yeah. also wore SA uniform and, you know, Certainly at the beginning, I think, he subscribed to it. Um, are we doing for time? Are we all right? Yeah. Um, oh, this is, um, this is the 
the best known Jewish inhabitant at Nobersdorf, a guy called Emil Schnell, who retired there. And everybody loved him. He was even friends with some of the well-known Nazis in the village. Um, but he also got this horrible letter with swastikas all over it from the Gestapo in February 1945, so just before the end of the war, and telling him to go to the report to go to Theresienstadt, so he chose to commit suicide. Alas, the, 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 the fate of many of the people that you write about, Julia, it's, I mean, the number of people that you give their little biographies at the end, and they, many of them did kill yes, themselves of course, to escape a worse fate. They did, but so too, at the end of the war, did the Nazis. There was an absolute um, epidemic of Nazis committing suicide, and it goes back to this sort of cult religion thing. They just couldn't conceive of a world without national socialism. Um, these are prisoners in the, they, they were from Dachau, um, the main camp, but they were sent to Oberstdorf to build and maintain the uh, sub-camp, um, which was the Waffen-SS training camp. And this is just after the um, German surrender, and they're still in their striped uniforms. And you can see the camp in the back, and they've just been liberated, which I think is a, a very heartwarming picture. Um, and yes, this was um, a... a uh, an American fortress bomber had to do a false landing at Zonthofen, which was just 10 miles north of, of um, Oberstdorf. And um, um, the boys who were in the Adolf Hitler school in that fortress, which was a sort of Nazi stronghold, um, one of them left an, an, an interesting account of how they managed to get into the airplane before the uh, German soldiers arrived. And um, they, they found Hershey chocolate bars. He said it was the first time he'd ever tasted chocolate. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that, that was right at, 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 the, at the end of the war. Um, but, but, but before we have to wrap up, um, what, happened, what happened at the end of the war? What happened uh, to Oberstdorf? Well, Oberstdorf had a very exciting end to the war. Um, it was unbelievably tense because one of the leading young men in the village decided uh, that he must do what he could to save Oberstdorf from bombardment. They knew that the Allies were coming, but there was this... The, Hitler's um, rule was that anybody who tried to surrender um, should be shot or hanged. So people were terrified of that, although Mayor Fink never went there. But um, then there were all these Nazis coming down from the north towards the mountains where they thought they would they would live and you know, have guerrilla, guerrilla warfare. So the village was completely divided between those who wanted to surrender and those who uh, wanted to support Hitler. And this uh, group of um, how they managed to do it in secrecy, but they got together a fighting force of men and they slunk into the village one night just before the end of the war and they arrested all the known Nazis and locked them up in the town hall. And then there was this agonizing wait for the Allies to arrive because they didn't know whether Nazis would come in from the mountains or what would happen. And finally, the French arrived in the middle of a blizzard and the surrender was enacted. It's quite a thrilling story. Um, so that was why Oberstdorf was saved from bombardment um, because the French knew there were a lot of Nazis in the area and they would not have been spared if this coup um, had not been... Um, successfully accomplished. Well, that, that's quite a, a triumphal story, but um, the, is the, the tale you tell of some of the young soldiers trying to get back home is, oh, is yes. very, very... Yes, and what is, you know, what is very touching is um, certainly one of the soldiers I talk about in the book, you know, he'd done everything right. Um, he, he hadn't committed any terrible acts of atrocity or anything, and, and yet he was sent off to France and, um, and I think, died there. Um, you know, it, it, it's, there's no justice really anywhere. The, and then, of course, so many Nazis were let out in 1952 when the American interest, of course, shifted to um, making sure that um, uh, Germany was a, a good ally to um, meet the Russian threat. And so 
too many Nazis were released. And uh, I fear a lot of good people were also locked up who perhaps hadn't done anything very terrible. It's not a fair world. No. Uh, your book has already been extremely successful. Um, you can agree. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Never. Just go on. <laughs> it's allowed. Um, I wonder if you know whether it has had any impact on, on the village. It's a, now a stream of tourism uh, with people clutching their well-thumbed copies of your book. No, do you know, I have I mean, no feedback It made feedback me want to go, just to see... Um, you make the atmosphere so strong that I, I immediately wanted to <laughs> be there. Well, that's very nice of you. It's a very kind thing to say, but I've had very little feedback from the village. The people who were really interested in getting this book done, because they... You know, they really wanted themselves to understand how it was possible that um, the Nazis got such a grip mm. on their country. Um, so there was a core of villagers who were very interested, but I suspect that most people aren't that interested, or, you know, they're getting on with their lives. I, I really don't know. Um, and I, I didn't actually mean it flippantly. I meant it, it, it does... It, you, you, you know, the, the details, the micro-history, you do want to go back and sort of and feel check it out, where yes, they well. stood and what they well, I, I, streets they walked in. It's actually quite... Um, I mean, now it's really more a small town than a village, but it's always still referred to as a village. And, you know, the, the tu it's still tourism that keeps the, the village going. Um, but I don't know whether... You know, interestingly enough, when Travellers was published, it, it was actually translated into lots of um, foreign languages, but not into German, and I think it's possible that the Germans have just had it up to yeah. here with the whole subject and just don't want to know any more about it. Well, Julia, before we finish, um, please tell us, and everyone will be very, very uh, ready to look up for this one, what your next <laughs> book is about. <laughs> <sighs> Such a relief to write about something really wonderful. Um, I'm, I'm very flattered when um, John Gilhuli asked me if I'd write a... Um, a history of Wigmore Hall. Um, of course, we have the 125th anniversary coming up, 2026. And so I have been absolutely immersed in that and loving it. Um, it's, it's just... It's the same technique. I, I can really only do one thing, and that is what I like to do is take a sort of big chunk of history and, and then go and look for the the individual stories, the human stories that you won't find in books that are not published. And, of course, it works wonderfully with Wigmore Hall um, because there are so many stories. And, of course, you've got this backdrop of history all the time, two world wars, and, uh, and then the post-war, post-Second World War problems and, and, and different people running the hall and, and the performers and composers and... There's so many stories. Um, it's been an absolute joy to get into that. And when, will we, when can we read it? Well, um, it, we've got a way to go yet. And, of course, it, I, I, we've, it, it, we've got the 125th anniversary, so I'm not quite sure. But I'm, I'm well on with it. Um, but <laughs> it's, getting, <laughs> it's getting tricky now because it's getting... Um, you know, getting up to the present day, and it's frankly, it's a lot easier to write about dead people than live people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Beware, all of you, of your stories may be told by Julia. No, um, I, 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 I'm sure it will. Well, we have. We're going to stop now, and Julia will be in the foyer. I think signing books and answering any of your questions um, after. And be delighted. I yep. think we'd all like to thank her enormously for writing two marvelous books with another one on the way, yeah, uh, so. and for coming to talk to us today. Thank you, Julia. Well, thank you, Fiona. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>